Good morning. Thank you for being here, both to the people in the room and to our online audience. My name is Gonzalo Paz Pardo, and I'm the secretary for the CHAMP Network. And I'm very happy to welcome you for our second day of the inaugural conference of the CHAMP Research Network. Ahead of us, we have a very exciting day with several sessions focusing on our core topic of monetary policy transmission, in particular related with climate risks, with the growing presence of non-bank financial intermediaries, and finally, with uh, business cycles and long run effects. At 11, we will also have our policy panel focusing on current issues for monetary policy transmission in Europe. Without further ado, let me give the floor to Carlo Nuno, who will chair the first session focusing on climate risk, bank lending, and monetary policy. Thank you very much. So welcome to all of you. We are very happy to start the second day. And let me give the floor to Marco. OK. OK. Um, I'm very uh, pleased to present here this uh, paper, which is joint work with Carlo Altavilla and Miguel Busigna from the ECB, who are sitting here in the audience, and Andrea Polo from uh, Louis University and uh, mm -hmm. the Institute. And uh, <clears throat> the topic, as you can see, uh, relates uh, uh, climate risk uh, uh, to bank lending and monetary policy. Actually, relates <laughs> bank lending and monetary policy uh, to climate risk. So essentially, the, the, the paper looks at two related questions. The first is whether banks price climate risk or not. And more specifically, whether in, insofar as they do, they look uh, at, they consider uh, just uh, current emissions of firms to uh, uh, measure this climate risk, or they also consider uh, future intended emissions, so they are also forward-looking, and whether banks that uh, declare explicitly to be uh, more committed to decarbonization actually price climate risk relatively more than other banks. The second question is uh, whether, assuming that actually banks do price climate risk, well, this, pr this price that they implicitly assign to climate risk in their lending activity is affected by monetary policy shocks. And here, we propose two alternative views that potentially can uh, um, uh, explain uh, the impact that monetary policy shocks can have uh, on the pricing on climate risk by banks. One being the so-called financial friction channel, by which essentially, uh, 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 monetary policy uh, acts uh, as in the uh, bernanke gertler tradition, uh, uh, tightening um, uh, lending condition, particularly for, uh, for, for firms uh, that have uh, relatively low collateral, low tangible assets, low collateral. And since uh, it is uh, well known that uh, green firms tend to be relatively uh, uh, less uh, uh, capital intensive or tangible capital intensive at least, this suggests that uh, a monetary restriction should affect relatively more, uh, uh, should be particularly harmful, so to speak, to uh, lending to green firms relative to brown firms. An alternative view is uh, an expanded version of the so-called uh, risk-taking channel of monetary policy which actually says that, uh, predicts that uh, a restricted monetary policy shock should affect particularly lending to risky firms. And uh, insofar as climate risk is one dimension of the, this risk, this should actually lead to the opposite prediction, that is a restricted monetary policy shock should be particularly harmful, uh, uh, particularly severe uh, for, for brown firms, which are riskier from the climate uh, risk viewpoint than for green firms. So as you can see, the predictions are diametrically opposed, and we want to see whether the data have anything to say regarding which of these two views, if any, is uh, 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 consistent with the data. So um, in terms of uh, the previous knowledge uh, on these two issues, the reason why it is worth actually looking first into the preliminary issue of whether banks price, climate risk or not, and to what extent they do. The primary reason for doing this is that uh, there is considerable controversy regarding uh, the fact that uh, risk, climate risk is priced in, in, uh, in credit markets. 
And this is in contrast with what actually we know about securities markets, because for securities markets there is abundant evidence that both in the stock market, in the bond market, and also in, in uh, uh, option markets, climate risk is indeed priced to some extent, especially after the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement. Now, I, I have no time to review all of this literature, but uh, it is relatively you know, uh, consistent in this direction. Whereas, in contrast, uh, uh, regarding credit markets, uh, the evidence is, first of all, limited uh, to um, uh, syndicated the syndicated loan market, which in Europe is about 10% of the total number of loans. Uh, but also, more importantly, it is uh, not homogeneous in its conclusion. Actually, there is a considerable uh, conflict between the findings, both regarding the, the first question, which is essentially whether banks do price or do not price climate risk. For instance, there is uh, this paper by uh, uh, Bayen, De Graaf, uh, Delis, and Ongena that uh, uh, find that uh, uh, banks do not price uh, climate risk or did not price the climate risk uh, arising from stranded assets in the fossil fuel industry. Um, and instead, uh, there is a paper by Ehlers, Packer, and De Graaf that find, uh, finds the opposite, at least uh, for the period after the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement. But also on the question of whether banks uh, committed or that declared to be committed to environmental policies uh, lend preferentially to low emission firms or to green firms relative to brown. Also there, there is no consensus. For instance, there, is, uh, there are these two papers by Eller, Packer, and De Graaf, and Gian, the recent paper by Gian, Gianetti, Giasova, Lumiotti, and Mendicino, who actually find that uh, uh, banks uh, do not actually do what they preach, in the sense that the banks that actually uh, uh, appear to be more committed to uh, decarbonization actually do not uh, uh, lend at differential rates or do not lend preferentially to green firms relative to brown firms. Actually, the paper by Janetti and others finds the opposite. Whereas uh, th these other two papers uh, by the Grays and, and co-authors, Hans is actually here in the audience, and uh, by Kaspersik and Pedro, find in, in fact uh, that uh, evidence in favor of the fact that banks that uh, uh, proclaim to be green actually uh, behave uh, consistently with that. So also on this score, there is some disagreement. And finally, on the other big issue that uh, we target in this paper, which is the impact of monetary policy on the pricing of climate risk, insofar as we know, there is no previous work. So there, whereas on the other topic, there is conflict in, in, in the evidence, on this second issue, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is no uh, previous uh, work that we know at least. Now, let me go a little bit, uh, since uh, this uh, second point, uh, the impact of monetary policy, um, on, uh, um, you know, climate risk is, uh, this is, uh, you know, the more noble part of the paper. It's also more, more uh, in line with the topic of the conference. Let me go a little bit deeper into these uh, two alternative hypotheses that I briefly outlined. First one is, uh, let's say, uh, let's start from the second one that I mentioned before, which is the risk-taking channel of monetary policy. What has this view to say uh, uh, to us regarding predictions about uh, the impact of monetary policy on the pricing of climate risk. L the idea uh, which is behind this view is that monetary policy affects uh, the yield-seeking incentives of banks. Specifically, monetary expansion actually encourages bank banks to loosen their lending standards, whereas monetary tightening uh, encourages uh, 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 banks uh, to tighten their lending standards, and specifically, monetary expansion uh, in encourages banks uh, to loosen them specifically in the direction of lending to riskier firms, and monetary tightening in the direction of uh, tightening relatively more for riskier firms. And the reasons behind this view have been, uh, you know, the theoretical underpinning have been laid out in several papers, one of which is, for instance, the paper by Achara and Nakti, the idea essentially in these papers is that there are some uh, incentive issues uh, in, uh, uh, in bank lending within the structure of banks. There are some moral hazard problems. And this, the, uh, these moral hazard problems uh, tend to be relatively um, encouraged or, or made, made worse, essentially, worsened by expansionary monetary policies. For instance, in Achara and Nakti, uh, 
The idea is that to elicit uh, loans officers' uh, effort, their pay is tied to loan volume, and when there is abundant liquidity, they have uh, uh, an encouragement, uh, therefore, to expand lending, especially to uh, riskier uh, firms. And De La Riccia and co-authors have a, 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 another paper, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, has a similar lo broad logic. Uh, it's based on the, the cost of monitoring of, 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 of banks uh, interacting with monetary policy. And importantly, there is uh, considerable evidence uh, that actually there is, uh, you know, uh, support for this risk-taking channel of monetary policy. For instance, a paper by De La Riccia, Levin, and Suarez finds that uh, U.S. banks lower their internal uh, risk rating uh, of uh, new loans uh, when monetary policy becomes uh, relatively more restrictive, when, when uh, uh, short-term interest rise, they become stricter in their lending standards. And there is, uh, conversely, a famous paper, a econometrica paper, by Jimenez, Ongena, Pedro, and Saurina, who find that uh, when ECB monetary policy becomes relatively more lenient, and uh, therefore overnight rates drop, less capitalized banks in Spain tend to loosen their lending uh, standards. And there is also a paper by Anderson and Cesabianchi that find uh, that a monetary tightening triggers a relatively larger rise in credit spreads uh, for riskier uh, uh, firms, uh, by which they, which they identify as uh, the more leveraged firms. So the overall prediction here is that the monetary policy tightening uh, is relatively more restrictive, so to speak, or generates a, a greater contraction in lending, a high, larger increase in interest rates for brown firms than green ones. And conversely, uh, if uh, we uh, turn to the other view, which is the view that is based uh, uh, on uh, Bernanke, Gertler, many other uh, people's work that says uh, that uh, uh, a monetary policy affects uh, uh, firms uh, through, uh, because of financial frictions. Uh, here, the view is that uh, in the presence of incentive problems within firms, uh, banks tend to provide relatively less credit to firms uh, with a lower ratio of tangible assets to total assets, so firms that can post less collateral and vice versa. Uh, for restrictive monetary policy. And since we know, uh, for, for instance, from the work by Jovino, Martin, and Sauvagnat, that uh, uh, green firms uh, tend to be relatively less uh, tangible capital intensive, we can expect them to suffer relatively more when there is a restrictive monetary policy shock. So here, the prediction is uh, completely the opposite. It is that monetary policy tightening is relatively more restrictive for green firms than for brown ones. Okay, so this is in terms of, uh, uh, you know, so to speak, you know, the hypothesis that guide our work. Regarding the data, we uh, draw uh, monthly loan level data from the ANA Credit uh, database that many of you, of course, uh, know. It is uh, this uh, Euro area uh, standardized uh, credit register that provides beautiful data regarding uh, lending and interest rates uh, to Euro area. Uh, firms. And on top of, of uh, these data, we have uh, emission data. Unfortunately, here, at least in the main regressions in the paper, we have to concentrate uh, 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 to, uh, on listed firms because for these we have uh, from the Refinitiv da database uh, both uh, the current level of emission, CO2 and CO2 equivalent emissions. Uh, we are using the scope one and scope two emission data to measure the current uh, amount of uh, uh, pollution that is uh, produced uh, by, by, by firms. Uh, and uh, um, in this database, we also have uh, a variable that measures uh, firms' commitment uh, to future emission, or better, the, the extent to which they target or they, 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 they announce that they target uh, a reduction in future uh, emissions. And uh, here we use a dummy variable, which is one if firms announce a target and zero if uh, they don't. And uh, this commitment is actually, has been shown by previous work uh, by uh, Carbone and others and Bolton and Kaspersik uh, to be not uh, cheap talk in the sense that it has uh, some predictive value for subsequent emission uh, uh, by firms. 
Um, now, in some regressions that we do not report yet in the paper, we expand our data set to also include unlisted firms for which we do not have uh, direct observation of their emission data, but we have uh, an imputed value, uh, value of emissions fr drawn from the Urgentum uh, database. Uh, so these are uh, 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 this is a firm that imputes based on sector size, uh, um, uh, sector and size of firms, uh, a certain level of emissions to firms that are unlisted based on, uh, you know, uh, what happens uh, to, the, um, uh, to the listed ones, uh, the, the amount of emissions uh, that is produced by the listed ones. So we, uh, and we find broadly consistent results. But of course, there we cannot control for industry and size simply because uh, those are being used uh, for, uh, uh, to, to effectively impute uh, emission, emission data. Uh, now, we also have in our data set uh, data about the bank commitment uh, uh, to reduce uh, uh, emissions, information about uh, specifically whether they signed a commitment letter in the context of the science-based target in initiative. Uh, so we have a zero one uh, dummy for that, uh, which uh, um, is the same variable that is used uh, by Kaspersik and Pedro in their 2021 paper uh, to measure uh, this uh, commitment by banks uh, to, um, or declared commitment by banks to reduce uh, emissions. And finally, the monetary policy shock uh, is drawn from uh, you know, the, the database, uh, the Euro Area Monetary Policy Event Study database, which has been built uh, by uh, Carlo and uh, co-authors uh, that measures monetary policy shock, uh, looking at the change over a 30-minute window around uh, ECB press conferences uh, expressed on a monthly basis, similar to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to um, uh, a variable which has also been used uh, for the Fed in other studies to measure monetary policy shocks. So in, this is in terms of um, uh, <clears throat> the um, main um, uh, the, the, the main um, uh, the data that we use uh, regarding the the actual um, data um, here you can see the first variable that we have in this table uh, we ha is uh, the the spread which is essentially the interest rate the banks uh, uh, charge on loans uh, relative to uh, a benchmark risk free rate of uh, corresponding maturity and uh, as you can see the standard deviation of this variable is uh, 0.76, this is important to bear in mind in order to understand the quantitative uh, uh, magnitude of the effects that we are going to find. We have a 75 basis point standard deviation for the main variable of interest. Uh, then we have data regarding the PD that we use uh, uh, as a measure uh, of credit risk. This is the average PD uh, uh, which is uh, reported by IRB banks uh, lending to a given uh, uh, firms. And you can see that uh, this is uh, pretty flat for most of the uh, this size of the distribution. It is only greater than the mean uh, uh, for the top decile of firms. So the risky, uh, the firms that you can really call uh, risky ones are those uh, with, uh, you know, which are in the top decile, at least in terms of credit risk. Then we measure uh, um, uh, emission risk by looking at the current, uh, at the current emissions, uh, the carbon intensity of these firms. And again, this is uh, very much right skewed, like the PD, only for the top uh, decile. You can see that uh, the uh, carbon emission intensity is larger than the mean. Uh, but uh, we also take this forward-looking uh, variable to measure uh, uh, emission intensity, this uh, target variable, which is whether a company has announced or not announced a, 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 an emission target. And you can see that 58% uh, of the companies have indeed done so. And most of these are actually uh, high emission, uh, relatively high emission uh, firms in our data. And then we have a variable that we call commit, which is uh, uh, a, a commitment that you know, that tells you whether the, a bank uh, has uh, uh, actually underwritten this uh, commitment letter, uh, and only 11% uh, of the banks appear to have uh, pledged that they, you know, they are committed to decarbonization. And finally, the monetary policy shock, you can see that the mean is positive because uh, our data, I forgot to tell you that, uh, refer to the period from 2018 to 2022, and so 
most of the monetary policy shock have been restrictive monetary policy shocks, so shocks in which our monetary policy variable uh, actually takes a positive uh, value. Okay, now in terms of results, let me start by showing you like just unconditional means over time for two uh, variable, outcome variables of interest, which both refer to uh, uh, loan premium. Uh, the graph on the left shows uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, loan premium, the, the interest rate which is charged uh, over and above the risk-free rates uh, to firms with low carbon emissions, and here by low I mean those in the bottom quartile by emissions, uh, so that's the green line, and firms with high carbon emissions, those in the top, fifth, uh, uh, top uh, quartile by, by emission intensity, you can see that uh, uh, the, the, the red line lies uh, consistently above uh, the other. The difference is on average uh, 12 uh, basis points. Um, uh, on the other side, on the right hand side, uh, you have a different breakdown uh, between firms uh, which have announced uh, that uh, an emission reduction target, that's a, a green line, and firms uh, which have uh, not announced an emission reduction target. And here you can see again that the red line lies above. Essentially, this is telling you that uh, firms uh, which uh, have announced uh, that they want to improve on the front of emissions uh, do uh, actually uh, get uh, a, a discount relative to those that have not. So this uh, is like preliminary evidence uh, that uh, uh, you know, uh, banks in the euro area do price uh, climate risk, but of course here we're not controlling for a zillion things in terms of uh, firm characteristics, bank characteristics, uh, uh, time, and so on and so forth. So let's go then to uh, um, uh, uh, estimates uh, of uh, panel regressions uh, where the dependent variable is uh, the um, uh, um, interest rate premium, and as you can see, the main uh, variables uh, that we put on the uh, right hand side as, uh, as uh, regressors are PD as a measure of uh, uh, here uh, as a measure of uh, uh, credit risk, uh, carbon emission intensity as a measure of uh, uh, climate risk, and target, uh, which is essentially the intended. Uh, uh, reduction in emissions in the future. As you can see, consistently in, in, in all the uh, uh, specifications, we have a gradual, we gradually saturate the, um, the specification with fixed effects. We find that uh, first, uh, the PD is associated with, as you would expect, uh, with a, a higher risk premia, uh, 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 sorry, interest rate premia. Uh, carbon uh, emissions uh, are associated with higher interest rates and target uh, uh, the announcement of, uh, uh, of a target in terms of emission with a discount. Uh, the, the impacts based uh, on the estimates, for instance, in column one, uh, are not uh, very large. I mean, there is a, a four basis point uh, premium for firms with high emissions, by which I mean those uh, in the uh, top decile uh, by emissions. There is uh, a 10% basis point discount uh, uh, for firms uh, that are committed to reduce emissions. And uh, there is a, a three basis points premium on firms with high PD. So it is not, a, a, the, in a way, the, the, the uh, the pricing of climate risk is not very large, but uh, it is of the same order of magnitude as uh, that of uh, credit risk as measured by the PD. Uh, then uh, we look uh, at uh, whether banks uh, which commit, declare to be committed to uh, um, uh, uh, the carbonization actually are stricter in pricing climate risk and are more lenient with firms that actually uh, uh, declare that they want to uh, decarbonize. As a matter of fact, you find precisely that. If you look at the interaction between this uh, commitment variable and uh, the carbon emission variable, you find it is positive, meaning that they are indeed stricter, not very much, by two basis points in terms of additional uh, 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 price uh, placed on climate risk on average. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, at the bottom uh, uh, row, you see that uh, banks that are committed actually are relatively more lenient, and here the effect is considerably large, a 16 basis point discount, uh, less than uncommitted banks uh, in lending to firms that actually declare that they want to reduce uh, emissions. 
Finally, let me come to monetary policy. Uh, and here, uh, the first, uh, uh, essentially, uh, the, the first uh, uh, column is just a sanity check type of uh, regression. We uh, want to see uh, whether uh, a contraction in monetary policy shock, first of all, is associated with an increase uh, in uh, risk premia. Uh, and uh, so in interest rate uh, you would expect, uh, and in fact uh, it is a, a 25 uh, basis point increase, uh, surprise increase uh, in uh, uh, policy rates is associated with a 35 basis points increase uh, in, uh, in premia. That uh, the impact uh, is particularly large for risky firms. Uh, you can see that from the interaction between the monetary policy shock and the PD. And this kind of is very important because it's already preliminary evidence that uh, the uh, credit risk view of monetary policy is consistent with the data. And of course, uh, it, it is uh, associated uh, with uh, 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 a larger, um, uh, in general, the, the PD is associated uh, with the higher interest rates. That's the first uh, uh, coefficient, as you would expect. Then what do we do is uh, we um, introduce fixed uh, time effects uh, in the regression. So we can no longer, in the subsequent uh, specification, we can no longer estimate the direct impact of monetary policy on interest rates, but we uh, look uh, more specifically at the interactions uh, and we ask, uh, is monetary policy indeed uh, making, uh, increasing uh, the price that uh, uh, banks uh, place on climate risk? And indeed, we find that uh, the impact uh, is uh, uh, positive. As you can see by the interaction between monetary policy and carbon emission, the coefficient is uh, positive and borderline significant, is uh, significant at the 10% level. And in particular, that monetary policy shocks uh, seem to uh, have, uh, the restrictive monetary policy shocks have to, uh, seem to have a relatively uh, 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 smaller effect on firms that announce uh, a target in terms uh, of emissions. So, so um, we find that, uh, broadly speaking, the evidence uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, supportive of uh, the um, great risk channel of monetary policy view uh, among those two. However, we have to recognize that monetary policy uh, tends to act with long and variable lags, as we all know. And so uh, here we have been looking just at the impact uh, effects uh, on uh, uh, um, uh, on interest rates, uh, on premia more specifically, uh, what if we look uh, at uh, both uh, the uh, like longer run impact uh, on, uh, on interest rates and uh, the impact uh, on the quantities uh, lent by, by, um, by banks uh, to, to these firms. So we do this by using local projection estimates uh, to capture these dynamic effects. Uh, and again, we do this uh, both for, in this case, both for uh, uh, interest rates, interest rate premia, and for quantities. And here are the results that we find uh, for uh, interest rates. So again, uh, well, first, uh, the first graph refers to the direct impact of the monetary policy shock on the lending spreads, which uh, is uh, reassuringly uh, positive, although not very large. Um, uh, it is, uh, well, I mean, it's a 25 basis points of price tightening leads to a 39 basis points rise in premium after 12 months, but the impact effect is not very large. It, 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 it does increase uh, uh, over time. Uh, interestingly, uh, we keep finding that uh, uh, there is an additional um, increase in premium for high emitters of uh, two basis points, again, consistently with the results I told you before from the panel estimate and there is a 5% mitigation effect for committed firms, but the, which becomes actually nine basis points after 12 months. But more interestingly, uh, if you look uh, at the dynamic effects on, for loan volumes, uh, these are considerably larger. A 25 basis point surprise tightening is associated uh, with uh, a, a gradual drop in lending of 2.5% uh, after 12 months. It is negligible upon impact, but becomes uh, considerable after uh, a year. Uh, and uh, there is uh, a doubling of the effect uh, for high emitters. So for high emitters, uh, actually, there is a further 2.5%. 2.7% uh, drop after 12 months. And uh, there is a 1.5 mitigation effect for the firms uh, that announced to have uh, a, a reduction uh, uh, target. Uh, 
Now, um, let me uh, conclude uh, with uh, evidence which is uh, really not drawn from our estimates, but is drawn from a survey that the ECB uh, uh, carries out, uh, the uh, bank lending survey. In July 2023, the ECB added uh, to the usual uh, survey uh, a question regarding uh, precisely uh, environmental risk, and uh, it asked uh, the respondents, the banks, uh, whether they changed their lending policies in a different way for uh, green firms, uh, what they call firms in transition, so uh, uh, com uh, that have announced that they uh, uh, are making investments in order to become uh, uh, greener, uh, and brown firms. Uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, both in terms of terms uh, and conditions, so broadly interest rates, and in terms of credit standards, so broadly lending uh, uh, quantities or attitude towards credit applicants, you can see that uh, uh, banks uh, um, uh, announced to, to be uh, reported to have tightened uh, lending standards relatively more for brown firms than for green firms and to have been uh, more lenient for firms in transition than uh, for brown firms. This is particularly important because this uh, survey comes right after a period, uh, a series of uh, contractionary monetary policy shocks. So it, uh, you know, it, it can be read as a kind of the reported response uh, by, by, by these uh, banks uh, to these uh, uh, shocks, among other things. And then, interestingly, the, the right-hand side graph uh, 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 provides a, a, a further breakdown uh, of uh, these uh, responses uh, between um, uh, committed and uncommitted firms. So for each of these classes, green firms, firm in transition, and brown firms, uh, it asks uh, banks uh, how they uh, have behaved vis-a-vis -vis, uh, committed and uncommitted uh, firms in terms of announcement uh, of a target. And you can see that uh, the uh, um, uh, policies of, of banks has been relatively uh, um, more favorable to green firms and firms in transition uh, for the committed than for the uncommitted. So just just to conclude, uh, essentially the uh, bottom line from the paper is that uh, uh, euro area banks appear to, uh, to price climate risk uh, in, the, uh, in the sense that uh, they are stricter with the high emission firms and relatively more lenient with those that announce uh, to want to reduce uh, uh, emissions, uh, that their commitment, uh, banks' commitment matters, uh, and that they differ in the pricing of climate risk uh, consistently with what uh, they appear to announce. Uh, and that monetary policy shock uh, uh, actually um, fits uh, with uh, 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 this uh, cre create risk uh, view or expand the create risk uh, uh, view of monetary policy uh, transmission um, with the contraction in monetary policy uh, uh, leading to higher premium and lower loan volumes uh, for brown firms uh, and relatively less so for green ones. So just a, a final uh, uh, warning uh, that we, we should not read our paper is saying that uh, restrictive monetary policy is uh, climate friendly per se. Just that, uh, uh, that is, it really helps uh, investment uh, uh, by green firms or uh, lending to green firms, uh, but it simply says that uh, it uh, uh, affects uh, uh, relatively less uh, green firms uh, than brown firms. So uh, its contraction effect uh, is there for all firms, but it's relatively milder for firms with low emissions and those that are committed to reduce them. Sorry for being slightly over time. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the discussion will be by Vaso, please. I just want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to discuss this paper. Um, um, so I will offer a very short recap of, of what uh, Marco already um, has described. So the research questions and the key answers that come from this analysis and then offer some comments. Um, so the key question, the first actually, that you, you could think of the paper as uh, divided into two parts. The first part is asking the question, do banks price climate risk? And why would they do that? Uh, uh, one reason is uh, pricing the default risk that uh, comes with uh, uh, being brown um, or uh, uh, issues that relate to transition. Um, and other has to do with reputation risks that uh, may be increasing. Um, 
So the answer to this question that the paper is giving is that yes, banks do price it, and they don't only price the current emissions, they also price uh, uh, future potential exposure. So it's, 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 it's a very positive message. Um, um, they, uh, we also they also find, the, the authors, that uh, banks that uh, publicly commit to, uh, to follow environmentally responsible lending policies, they do so more than other banks. Okay? So this is, the, the, for the first part, the, the, the key results. And on the second part is, is actually, so for the first part of the analysis, as, as Marco has said, there's a lot of analysis looking at them, and, and I will come back to that on, on, on sort of mixed results in the literature. Um, but the second part on the effect of monetary policy, um, the results, uh, uh, this is a new, uh, this is more new, uh, and, um, and uh, the question is, does uh, current monetary policy, if you want, uh, the current uh, tightening, uh, does it hurt um, uh, green firms? Um, here, uh, I, I, I mean, yes, the, the premiums uh, are lower, but one thing I could see from the analysis is that it squeezes the differential uh, between, um, uh, so higher, uh, higher interest rates effectively lead to smaller differentials between green and brown, as I, I read it. Uh, um, and, and, and so, um, so this is kind of the, the takeaway, uh, in a sense. Uh, now, my comments. So, um, just a brief uh, uh, overview of comments. The first, uh, you know, the question is, is really important to understand, do banks price it? What are the implications of, of changes in monetary policy, which may be targeting inflation? Um, what, what may be side effects uh, on, on when it comes to, to, to the environment? Um, the analysis is very competently executed. Uh, I have no quibbles with, with, with the analysis. Uh, the paper is very, very well written, very clear, it's to the point. So I do encourage all of you to, to read it. It's a pleasure to actually read and go through that. Um, and an and important uh, aspect, which may be even uh, more important in, in this context, given the, the, the role of CHAM, um, is that it provides evidence for the entire Euro credit area uh, using ANA credit. And, and, and so it's, it's an important departure from uh, if you want uh, some of the existing literature. Now, some of my comments, uh, I'm gonna have four suggestions. Um, they are gonna be sort of on a broader level, thinking on, on, on okay, this is what the evidence is in, in the current um, state of the paper. If you were to think to sort of strength, to, to change something or enrich something, make some suggestions where there could be potential uh, places to, to enrich uh, um, the takeaway from the paper. So, um, as already Marco pointed out, there is an existing literature looking on the first part of the question as to whether banks are, are pricing uh, a risk and whether banks that have made a commitment to, to, uh, uh, to climate risk are pricing it more so. And overall, the results uh, are quite mixed, okay? And me, as, a, as an occasional reader of this literature, I would love to know more, and I suppose also the policymakers to know more wh why are we getting mixed results uh, uh, typically. And I believe that the paper, um, you, using data from uh, you know, a, a big data set that covers uh, a broader spectrum of firms and across many different countries, may be uniquely uh, positioned to offer the reader some idea why it might be the case that from, from different analysis we are getting uh, sort of mixed results. And, and there, uh, one, one suggestion I will make is potentially try to estimate the various uh, betas and create sort of a heat map. If you look at the composition of, uh, of firms and a spectrum of bigger firms, smaller firms, or uh, banks in settings where uh, regulators have, uh, have taken a stronger stance, do you see the uh, systematic relationship? Where do you get the stronger results and where are they weaker? And that would be useful for us maybe if, if we map it to studies we have found yes or, or no in one of these questions to kind of understand uh, potentially where the mixed results are coming from. Most of the existing literature is using syndicated loan data which draw on on larger firms, here uh, you, have, you have more, and potentially you could exploit that further. Um, so 
Another, another point I, I, I would like to bring up, uh, and this is not specific to this paper, uh, my reading is in the entire uh, literature, this is something that affects the interpretation, is when we are looking at has a firm adopted a target or has a bank uh, committed to an environmentally responsible uh, lending policy, both of those are choices, either it's a choice of the firm or it's a choice of the bank. And so there are, as I, as I read the literature, my impression is a, a key uh, weakness um, across the literature, it's not specific to this paper, uh, is that that's an endogenous choice and one may be, and that affects the interpretation, it may be, one may be picking up uh, um, the selection aspect. Um, and I think it, it, will be, um, it, it will be useful potentially here to, to, to make some progress on that in trying to get a sort of an instrument to the choice of ma uh, uh, for making that choice. Uh, often in the literature, uh, uh, people use external pressure to, to construct an instrument. And again, the nature of the data set may be better uh, suited um, uh, to, to uh, given the heterogeneity across countries and different stuff uh, that they may have taken. So that may be a dimension one can, can, can push the, the literature further and push the paper further. Um, on the mechanism, so, um, so the, one of the main equations the paper estimates, this is the baseline uh, model if you want to, uh, there is a, uh, uh, one looks at the interest rate the bank charges to, to firm F, uh, um, and, and this is regress on the probability of default of the firm, uh, what are the carbon emissions of the firm, and what is the target if, a, if, if, the, comp, if the firm has made a target, uh, 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 and then uh, uh, the ca carbon interacted with the target. Let, let's take that. Um, so I, um, how should I think of, uh, so my question here is in, an, in a setting where we have both the probability of default and the carbon, how should I be thinking of the beta two? So what does it exactly capture? So on one hand, you may be expecting bank to, to, to price, to price uh, the emissions, and one reason they will do that is because uh, uh, it's, it's riskier, it involves uh, risk, future risk, uh, credit risk. Uh, but if, if already we have the PD there, what, what, how do I interpret the beta? What are they pricing exactly? Are they pricing the fact that the PD doesn't reflect the carbon? You are discussing a little bit that, and I will encourage more discussion on, on what is it on top? Is it capturing the reputation concerns? Um, and so both, I suspect both, but uh, it will be useful to first discuss this a little bit more, so how I should think about that. And second, maybe also do some analysis a little bit, how much is in the PD already the carbon reflected and, and, and so on. Uh, and sort of to unpack further the mechanism, one could, uh, I was, uh, one could go further to estimate specifications separately by type of loan, um, by the type of collateral that is used. And that may give us some more information as to what exactly is the bank worrying about and, and, and pricing. So one could imagine that uh, the, uh, in a short-term loan, the climate risk uh, associated um, uh, may be smaller, um, depending on the type of collateral uh, that is pledged. So these could be dimensions uh, that one could, uh, could uh, use, uh, given the available data, to kind of un unpack more the mechanism. Um, and, and, and basically, um, my understanding is that the, you know, the data in an accredited could potentially give you some more information on, on uh, not, not only to the loan to a firm. So you could imagine a firm um, has some brown loans and, and some green loans, and maybe you can have even more loan specific or even collateral specific information about uh, exposures to, to, to exploit there. Um, so, so on the monetary policy, uh, my understanding is that it, it's uh, the, um, the current monetary policy may be effectively, uh, ultimately uh, slowing down uh, the pace for de decarbonization. Um, and, and here, uh, I was wondering if there is a, an element, again, exploiting the, the nature of the data to, to try to understand the settings under which this is l less. So to, to, to look at the heterogeneity again, and I'm, uh, what I'm thinking in this context is more, okay, in settings where 
um, uh, um, uh, banks are facing um, beyond monetary policy other reasons, whether this is broader regulation, whether consumers are more sensitive to these issues, whether uh, they face climate stress tests, uh, and so on, to, to try to uh, uh, use this to see if uh, um, on the margin, they, when beyond monetary policy, you have uh, a stronger, if you want, um, fiscal uh, policy or other broader financial policies uh, uh, um, making uh, climate risk more relevant to them to, to see if that uh, uh, squeezing is, is, is lower. Uh, that, that's my comments are, are more on sort of thinking, okay, here we have the analysis, what, in which dimensions can we expand and where could it, could it be useful? Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if you want, I think it's better if you, you want to collect some questions or you want just to... Maybe I just quickly respond on one yeah. point. Yeah. Um, okay. First of all, thank you very much. I mean, these are very constructive, very useful uh, comments. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are two points uh, um, on which I would like to reply. One uh, regarding uh, endogeneity, uh, the fact that uh, adopting a target is a firm choice. That's a, a good point. Uh, uh, insofar as uh, you say that this uh, could, uh, uh, you know, uh, induce selection issues, we try for the moment uh, to address this as much as possible by inclusion of, of fixed effects to control for uh, uh, all possible uh, characteristics, like we have the most demanding specification is one in which we have firm uh, effects and, um, uh, and, and time effects, so, so we essentially exploit only time series variation within the time series variation for for, for firms, but uh, but that's a, a well taken point. It would be hard to think of a good instrument, though. Uh, I would uh, I'm afraid uh, on the issue uh, you touched on the issue that. Um, we are controlling for PD. So what, what the heck is uh, uh, the reason why, why these banks over and above uh, 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 the PD, they are pricing climate risk. The PD should be capturing default risk already. Banks, in principle, you could say, should only care about default risk, not uh, for uh, about uh, uh, climate risk uh, per se. Well, one reason why this uh, can be the case, as you hinted at, is that uh, the internal risk models on which uh, uh, that PD is uh, based uh, may not uh, be suited to capture yet, at least, uh, 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 climate risk. And indeed, uh, when we do a simple compute, simple correlation between the PD and uh, emission uh, intensity, we find zero correlation, not significant, very small. So essentially, it looks as if uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, emission intensity variable is capturing a dimension which is uh, currently uh, not yet included in the, um, in the PD. And why it is not? Well, first, because measuring climate risk may be very difficult with the current way these risk models are built. It could be, as you mentioned, on a different horizon, a longer horizon than that which is taken into account by these models. It could be also that, to some extent, these banks also have securities which are exposed to climate risk, and therefore they take into account the covariance uh, which is induced uh, uh, by the presence of climate risk in their loan base, uh, we, and that's why they want additionally to price it uh, in their loans. I mean, we still don't know, but uh, clearly uh, the evidence is telling us uh, that uh, the PD is not fully capturing uh, climate risk, so I will stop here. Um, Thank you. So we are going to collect some questions. Uh, I beg you to stand up and identify yourself before making your question. The first question was already pre-booked by, by Paolo. There, please. Thank you very much. Paolo Surico, London Business School. Uh, was very, oh, I need to stand up, I'm told. Thank you. Do I have to bow? No. <laughs> so, uh, interesting, I love it. I wanted to ask whether there is an even bigger price down the road, either for this paper or another paper. You look, you look at prices, uh, I think the next step would be to look at quantity. What I have in mind is uh, loan, investment, but also dividend. Um, and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because, uh, maybe here I'm biased on, uh, from my own research, uh, 
but uh, I have a strong sense uh, that uh, the one that are high emission firm are also the one that are most capital intensive. Yeah. We also know uh, from some research, including my own, that when there is a change in monetary policy, capital intensive firms tend to respond more through investment, whereas non-capital intensive firms tend to respond more through dividends. Does your result imply or could you look into whether climate risk amplify the effect of monetary policy? Because if the effect is stronger on capital intensive firms, and those are the ones that respond more with their investment, this implies, especially through a collateral channel, that they are responding much more through investment than non-capital intensive firms are doing through dividend. And I think this is something that could be very useful for uh, monetary policy, especially because you can quantify relative to a benchmark in which there is no distinguish between green and brown firm. So you can see, okay, climate risks contribute to X percent of the amplification of monetary policy. The second point I wanted to raise, uh, I wanted to, if you don't mind, for the purpose of the discussion, to quibble uh, a little bit with the interpretation on the collateral channel. Uh, my intuition, and the model maybe would be needed to confirm or prove me wrong, is that the collateral channel will suggest that brown firms will be more affected. And the reason is simply because those firms that are less capital intensive is not that they don't access credit. We know that a big chunk of those firms, they access credit from an income base constraint later, rather than a collateral base constraint. And we also know that following a monetary policy change, asset prices move much more than income. So in fact, I would suspect that when, exactly for the Bernanke, Gertler, Kyutaki, Moore type, type of mechanism, I would expect a collateral channel to affect much more brown firms than green firms. And in fact, I think it would be still consistent uh, with your result. So I wonder, uh, 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 I mean, the, the estimates are great. I'm just uh, uh, challenging the interpretation whether still might be fully consistent with uh, a collateral uh, channel the story. Thank you. So, Philip. Thank you, Philip Hartmann, ECB. So, uh, fantastic paper, very impressive. Thank you for contributing it uh, to CHAMP because we have also ECB involved. Um, I have three points. So, first of all, um, since I see Frank Elderson from the ECB board sitting there, the vice chair of the uh, ECB banking supervision, um, there's also messages obviously here for banking supervision. So, of course, we are here interested in monetary policy, but I think there was big time also messages for the risk monitoring and uh, uh, supervision of, of, of the banking risks. But um, then if, uh, the question is always in these studies, in this literature, there's a lot of focus of is, is that risk priced? The question is then the big elephant in the room, is it uh, large enough? Is it large enough relative to the quote unquote objective risks? Is it large enough for the Paris objectives and thing, things like that? So I would be interested to which extent you have something to say about it. Um, they, uh, obviously, that is a challenge. And my last point um, is on this nice, this, 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 this squeezing of the difference of the spread between the green and brown discrimination that one saw so beautifully in your first plot. I think. Uh, um, yeah, uh, you, the discussant also did, um, Vasu did also comment on it at, towards the end. So the question is, wh what's, wh wh how does it come that the green and the brown rates, so to speak, become more similar in a period of very uh, fast monetary tightening? And I was wondering whether apart from the traditional banking uh, variables, there's also something we can learn from the inflation discussion we had and the pricing uh, discussion we had in the, in, the, in the high inflation period. So if you have a, there could be different stories of a behavioral type of uncertainty or something that allows banks to exploit a previously more precise tightening to their benefit um, and uh, uh, pricing less, less accurately for business reasons, for profitability reasons or something. So I wonder whether something could be looked at in the context of the paper. But thank you, very impressive. Impressive. There was also a question here, please. 
Okay. So I want to um, um, go back to this issue of uh, the mixed results. So of course uh, there is uh, now a famous uh, journal of finance paper that uh, there are non-standard errors that even in very conventional setting uh, lead to different results, but I think that here uh, also economic mechanisms are important and uh, I want to offer two that uh, should be stressed. One is uh, an issue of sample related to borrower visibility. Of course, uh, banks uh, that uh, make uh, some claims, uh, they can uh, greenwash only in the least visible part of their portfolio. So sometimes when we measure emissions, we don't have information about that. The um, other mechanism is uh, what, we, uh, what channel we are trying to pin down, uh, that is, uh, is value or values? And here I'm paraphrasing uh, Laura Stark's uh, presidential address, uh, meaning that uh, if uh, we look at credit risk, it's something that affects uh, financial intermediaries' payoff. And I think that at this, at this point, all agree, uh, we all agree that investors care about money. But when we talk about values, then uh, I think that uh, there is uh, more room for mixed of preferences and for greenwashing. So, this is it. Thank you very much. So we collect the last question. Paloma. So uh, good morning, Paloma Lopez Garcia from the ECB. I, this is a question about complementarity of different types of policies. So my question is, um, you know, the, the, the carbon intensity of a firm is really also a sign of exposure to transition policies. No? It's going to be more affected by the risk of stranded capital, etc. So my question is, um, maybe it would be worthwhile you know, exploiting the cross-country dimension of the data set to see whether this effect is stronger for countries in which transition policies, environmental regulation, carbon taxes, etc., are stronger. Because this is also going to give us um, a, a tip, if you want, some suggestion about where are we going to go um, uh, looking forward, no? because transition policies are going to become more stringent. Thanks. So we can't have a premium question at the end, but please be very brief. Okay, Laurent Morin, European Investment Bank. Thanks for the nice paper. I have one question which is related to the bank attitude. You said that some banks were uh, committed to green target. Do you see a change in their client base? So like a brown company going to brown banks and uh, green banks attracting green clients. So, if you can... Okay. <laughs> Not easy. Okay, <laughs> let me uh, try to answer at least some of, the, of these questions. One by Paolo. Um, I, I agree, an implication uh, of um, our estimates is that insofar as brown firms are relatively more capital intensive, uh, so presumably also those that uh, when they invest, they invest more in physical assets, then the implication of our estimates is that this mechanism that we document uh, would make uh, uh, restrictive monetary policy uh, relatively uh, uh, you know, more harm, harmful or, you know, for in its effect on investment, on physical investment. But uh, interestingly, uh, it would uh, 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 it would not uh, it would uh, 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 not have the same effect on the mix of investment. So it would be uh, effectively compressing investment relatively more than otherwise. But uh, the mix of investment would be uh, uh, more skewed towards uh, uh, green investment than, uh, than than brown. So there is uh, something in a way positive in that dimension on the quality of investment. Um, regarding what Philip uh, said, uh, he's right. Uh, those uh, initial pictures um, re uh, you know, seem to point to a squeezing of the differential. As, uh, this was also Vassos, one of Vassos' points. Uh, why is that the case? Uh, because if you think the estimates are really telling us that uh, when monetary policy becomes more restricted, uh, uh, um, conditions should become relatively harsher for brown than green, so the two should actually diverge. But actually, if you take into account that many of, of these uh, brown firms have announced uh, a, an emission target, that effect goes in the opposite direction, and that effect is pretty strong. Uh, 
And uh, in my view, that can explain why in these descriptive statistics we have actually a compression of the differential, because mo m many of those uh, <clears throat> firms in the red line which uh, that have uh, actually uh, that, uh, that have high emissions have actually announced that they, they have an emission target and therefore those actually enjoy a, 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 a more favorable treatment uh, in response to the restrictive monetary policy. Um, and uh, okay, this uh, final uh, point regarding uh, exploiting cross-country differences in other dimensions of policy, I think it's uh, extremely, uh, extremely interesting. <clears throat> and uh, we um, should uh, think about how, you know, whether we can we can take that into account. And finally, on the very last question, uh, we will investigate on that, whether actually there is uh, an impact on, uh, on uh, the customer base uh, as, a, as a result of these, uh, uh, of, of these policies. Oh, just one thing regarding what Paolo said, we are already looking at quantities. We are looking at lending, lending amounts. We are not yet at least uh, looking at quantities in the sense of uh, a firm level investments and stuff like that. But in principle, by linking up our uh, uh, data with um, uh, uh, data regarding the financial variables for these firms, uh, say in Orbis, we could, uh, we could uh, address this interesting point. Yeah, that, that's all I have. So thank you very much.